It started with a simple question. Can I press record? Four years and now 200 episodes later, Narrative has grown into not just the largest Africana studies classroom in the world, but also the most engaged community committed to freedom. It is Nubia. It is the bringing of the bricks. It is the clean glass of water. It is us. In Class with Car has revolutionized the way we gather to learn, to share, and to build as a community. We thank you, Dr. Carr and Professor Hunter. We love you. And to those of you who have shared your thoughts, your stories, and your wisdom, we want you to continue this incredible journey with us. We appreciate you more than words can say. Good morning. Hi. Happy, good everything. <laughs> I'm speechless. Okay, we all saw that the for the first time, except you. <laughs> oh yeah, no. good everything. Whoa, whoa, wow. Yeah, yeah, that, that was your that, raise. Uh, I said, I said you raised. You know, because you know, I don't, I don't really uh, publicly celebrate my birthday. Yeah, um, me neither. Clay Kane recently had 200 episodes on his show. I was like, I don't even know how many episodes I got. <laughs> it's serious. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I, don't do my, I don't do the milestone thing. So I'm like, all right, we at 100, we had Philip Bailey come through and Gene from Jeanne and, you know, Gene uh, sang to you and it was beautiful. Um, I was like, 200. Oh, I guess we have to do something. So Uraeus uh, was like, listen, I got it. So Uraeus is bad plan i'm sitting here that's where we are that's where we are what what quantum leaps have we taken in these four years good night well we all love each other that is and we all love you this none of this would have happened had it not been on that number one of course just emptying into it and on that on uh, on number 100 of course you found ajua to come in and that's right. Spent, she, she, I she kicked, it yeah. kicked it off. I could not believe we, of course, we were still in, in the thing, although we were emerging on the other side of the pandemic. Three hours and 54 minutes. That's an hour longer than Cat uh, and uh, Shane. <laughs> We wait, but, we uh, did three, wait, we did three hours. Episode. Number 100 was three hours and 54 oh. minutes. Minutes. That's right. Ajua, Jimmy Baylor, like you said, Clay said, came from Brazil. Oz, that's when Baba Oz first kind of showed up to be talking like that. Mata Jubea, uh from the UK, Lurie, and by the way, Lurie and, and El Joy announced on uh, December the 30th the transition of John Flateau, who was uh, David Dinkins' chief of staff, longtime professor at Mega Evers, and one of their Jegnas kind of trained him in the art of politics. So I wanted to mention that. But they all came. They all came three hours and 54 minutes. <laughs> so we, we've, uh, we've reduced that substantially and still moving in that direction. But, uh, but today that was, um, you know, just evidence of the, the growth and the direction. That's amazing. Those graphics, the whole racing them not playing, huh? What's the brother? The, uh, Mark Barnes, Mark Barnes. Um, oh, the Barnes. Well, and I also want to, you know, you, your mom made transition during these 200 episodes. Um, and you never missed your own, your mother. And then your, your um, spiritual mother also made transition last week. Um, mm. And you, you show up, you show up, you know, every week you show up. So. <laughs> well, I mean, it's so funny you say that. Uh, my Shariki, Juwan's a born and raised in Indianapolis, uh, made transition on the last day of Kwanzaa, Imani, 1.36 a.m. She, uh, which is which is classic Mashariki, uh, 1.36, one plus three plus six, take Sam Reynolds to get into it. One plus three plus six plus six is 10. And of course, if you take that 10 and say one plus zero, that equals one. So she went out on the one, which is, if, if anybody says she didn't plan it, then y'all not paying attention. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But, uh, you know, she's from, as she would always say, she and her husband, Kamal, and their children will be going out there next week for the ritual in Indianapolis. And people will be coming from all over. Uh, they are from the 60s. 
she was uh, apprenticed by Queen Mother Moore, the Mario Bedelli, Chukwa Lumumba, all of them. They are Mary Baraka. She goes back to the early days, a founding member of the Kwanzaa Collective out there in Indianapolis and with Mama Portia and so many others, um, just, just so many others. But she would often say what they all said, Hannibal F. Freak out of Chicago, the Council of Independent Black Institutions, the reparations movement. She was the female co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. We did a, a hour long tribute to her on WPFW. Uh, Y'all can find out there on YouTube, the, the Black Power lawyer in Kichi Taifa, her sister. Did, we did one and also Sister Kibibi, uh, Kibibi Tiemba, who was her longtime comrade and sister. But they all would say the saying in the 60s, Kazi is the blackest of all. Kazi is Kiswahili for work. So anytime anybody would get tired, or they would say, remember, Kazi is the blackest of all. Y'all can talk, <laughs> y'all can do, <laughs> but work is the blackest of all. So y'all talk that black talk, but where are you? And she and Kamal would show up anywhere. And their first question was, what can we do? How can we help? It didn't matter. They were in Durban for the World Conference Against Racism right before 9-11 in 2001, where racism was declared, declared a crime against humanity. Um, they were, had been everywhere. Last time I saw her, we were in uh, Ohio when we did in class from out there in Martin Delaney's ritual, they had driven over from Indianapolis, but a teacher, a warrior, a pragmatist, Pan-Africanist, mother, sister, daughter, um, her husband Kamal to her children, Ayoka and uh, Sebeko, named for the great South African struggler, David Sebeko, Jahi and Sala. We'll all see each other. And I, I'll tell you one other thing about her. When we met, she was the assistant director of multicultural affairs in the Office of African American History for the Indianapolis Public Schools. Um, this was 1993. And we were in was living in Columbus, Ohio, in grad school out there. And we used to do a radio show on Saturday morning. It's called Free Your Mind. You heard me talk about this before. And we would buy time on the radio <laughs> and I uh, forget the name, the call letter. Somebody in Columbus, Ohio would know this. WCKX was it? Anyway, doesn't matter. It was a, a st station owned by a black, um, a black station owner, Papa Jack. I forget his last, Papa Jack's what they called him. He had a club, nightclub in the clubs. Anyway, we did that show for the better part of a year until we did a two-part series on the politics of interracial relationships. And uh, Jack was married to a white woman. And so <laughs> at, at that point, our money was no good even. We couldn't buy it. <laughs> but we were young, and, you know. I never far. Oh, my God. Bill, <laughs> Bill, I have a side note. Bill Moss, a uh, brother who's an ancestor now, was on the Columbus School Board. I mean, a fiery force for Black people his, his entire life. I mean, he was a legend in Columbus. And he had a show. <laughs> right after our show. We went at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. It's the same time as if you remember, those of y'all out there remember UMTV Raps. We counter-programmed UMTV Raps. And then we would rush over to East Columbus where uh, Baba Mariba Kelsey, Mama Niabi Kelsey and their children had established along with the community out there, still out there, Tawi Village, the African Center for Study and Worship. And they had a food co-op. So we would do our show, get the cassette tape from the recording, go to the African Center, and we had one of those brick duplicating uh, cassette duplicators, one to four, uh, that the Nation of Islam used to use when Farrakhan would speak. Then you go in, and then they give you the tape, you buy the tape. So right. we bought one after seeing the Nation had one, and we would make copies of the tapes and sell them, and then we get the money to pay the radio station for another week. Bill Moss was out there the week before we got canceled. His show was coming on after us, I think at 11. And there's on that tape, you can hear us talking about, you know, we're talking about history, culture, and then we're going through all the black men married to white women, all the <laughs> black women married to white men. We roasted it, and you can hear him in the studio listening to the glass. He's behind. So we're in there, and you just hear him tell old them niggas. Tell old them niggas. <laughs> He's yelling in other words, tell on them in words. He is so far. I mean, it was hilarious. Anyway, anyway, all that to say that those tapes made it around the country. People would send in mail where you mail us the tapes. And so Charles Hankerson, who I never met, he became an ancestor. Uh, Charles Hankerson was a guy in Indianapolis, Indiana, 
never met Charles Hankerson. Hankerson was, I knew him because he would write us. We would send him the tapes. He put the tapes in people's hands around Indianapolis and Mashariki and Kamal got a copy of those tapes. Mashariki said, let's invite them to the Indianapolis uh, infusion conference because you know that was the time when everybody was doing these infusion and multicultural education conference. that was the the war by the way um Hakeem and Hassan Jeffrey's father made transition last week I saw uh yeah um Hassan posted something in social media and I only met him one time and that was when you remember when they were after their uncle Leonard Jeffries at City <laughs> College and I came up for the trial. I wrote up with Malefi Asante. In fact, we went to the trial and I knew everybody up there, all the people from uh, uh, First wow. World the Study Group. And but before that, before he went to trial, because he was suing it for defamation, he actually, you know, scored a victory in that. But he came to Ohio. We, I, I convinced the, uh, the Black Cultural Center where I was working as a graduate assistant, let's get Dr. Jeffries out here. So we brought Dr. Jeffries, John Henry Clark, Vivian Gordon, Tony Martin, so many others. And, and part of it was an excuse for me to sit with them. So he showed up, he and James Small showed up in Columbus, Ohio with this other brother who was looking like a bodyguard. And Jeffries was wearing a bulletproof vest around the country at the time because he couldn't take any chances. And he said, I want y'all to meet my brother. This is my brother. He's my bodyguard, too. And that's the only time I met uh, Hassan and Hakeem's father, who was a good brother, <laughs> but he was right by his brother's side. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And he did look like a bodyguard because I saw that same image because I think it was at um, Hassan's graduation. Yes. He posted a picture. And his father looks like he is, don't, you're not to mess with him. Do not play. Do not mess with him. And of course, the and irony of irony is, of course, our son is a professor in the history department at Ohio State now. So, I mean, it's just like, I mean, but they were they were younger. I mean, they were they were very they were younger than we are. So anyway, I went through all that to say this. The tapes made it to Indianapolis. Hankerson puts it in their hands. Mashariki then calls and said, y'all want to come to Indianapolis and do this conference? Yeah. And when I went out there, me and Valethea went out there. And another brother, Brian Mawada Harris, who's in North Carolina, good brother. We all went to law school together. And then we went to grad school. Well, that is when Sankofa had just come out. So it was Mashariki that introduced us to Haile Garima. They brought the film to Indianapolis. They were always doing stuff like this. Tony Browder, Marimba Ani was out there because I knew my Marimba and Tony, but not Haile. So we all got together. And then at the Black Expo later on, they brought out Tupac. And so if you ever was this is a Tupac documentary that's got a clip from that. He's up there on the stage. Bro, he said, I don't care where you call yourself, African, African-American. We out here in these streets. We got to come. Juice had just come out. Mashariki is the one who put that together. It was a youth track at the Indianapolis Black Expo. But she was one of those people who, if you didn't know who she was, you would think, oh, it's this beautiful sister. She and my mother are very good friends. They came to our graduation. She didn't come out. I mean, you, when we got our doctors. Just very good people, but everybody in the movement knew her well. And so Leonard Dunstan, I mean, it was so many people who called in. Uh, Ray Winbush, of course, from uh, from Morgan State, just so many others. Um, she was a very good friend of and took very good care of Mama Mari Evans, who lived in Indianapolis, the poet. In fact, we went over how one time she took us over her house and uh you know, we spent time with Mari Evans because Mashariki and Kamal took care. She cooked. She brought them food. She, the, I mean, in that this uh, library, the Children's Museum, I'm a portion of them. They did so much work. So, yeah, she uh, she made transition. And in that spirit, my mother, of course, your father, all of our ancestors who don't take days because, you know, nobody, our enemies don't take days and, and think that it is an honor to be able to do work. She would be reminding us right now that Kazi is the blackest of all. <laughs> so work is the blackest of all. So. And, that, and, and as you're talking, part of the emergence of narrative and now Nubia is to continue to work and to remind people That's so right. that these people will never be forgotten or gone because the baton is firmly in our hands now. We have a responsibility to carry on the work, right? We have responsibility to be the blackest of all, Kazi. We have, black to, have to do the work. We have to that's do the work. Right. So that's, right. that's why it's like, okay, 200, we put our head down. What's going to change? It's the first uh, January 6th. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's the first uh, Saturday in January. So we get to be here on that new year. 
Um, moving forward, we're going to start filling in some of the blanks, you know, so in class with car over 200 episodes, you got a rhythm and a lot of it was bouncing off of what was happening in the news. Nubia came uh, uh, about primarily out of defense because we were talking about some things that were making uh, the bots, I think, or uh, angry people angrier and they would come and disrupt. So, so our first defense was to not be live. Um, but it took away from the exchange and the engagement. You know, it's a special yeah. thing to be in that chat and talk with other people at the same time that things, you know, people are remembering things and uh, sharing their own, you know, history. And it, it makes it even more rich. So we're going to still be live, but maybe not uh, on YouTube, even though we've switched off because we're going to be filling in, uh, doing some some tapings around books and stuff. But we'll go live, of course, always in Nubia. So join us. Those of you who have not gotten your narrative subscription, this is a good time to come on over because we're going to be doing even more things. Uh, we have a cybersecurity class that's about to start, we're doing more stuff with money and language and um, genealogy and writing and uh, the community is is just growing leaps and bounds. And, and Uriah, speaking of that, went to school to learn more about AI. And, you, you know, that that to me is the hallmark of what it means to be in community. He he has a certain set of skills. A man is a genius as it relates no. to, uh, you know, graphic novels and comic books. He's the founder of Black Heroes Matters. And mm -hmm. he's the person that is out at Comic-Con and all the cons, Blur Con, and, and <laughs> it's the fulcrum in many ways but he realized that he needed more skills. So, yeah. and he even went over, you know, overseas to a conference that he was only pretty much the only black person there to learn more about it internationally. Mm -hmm. And because he want that was his brick that he was bringing to us. So, uh, so now he's working with our animator to create these things because you need collaboration. You need the person that yeah. can hopefully do it, but also imagine the world, but also do it. You know, it's, I just I'm I'm so humbled by that because I didn't say, hey, go get more skills. He was like, I'm I'm taking this class. I was like, okay, let's see what Absolutely. happens. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm going overseas. Okay. And now he's <laughs> producing these things, you know. Um, yes. and you didn't have to ask permission. Just do it. Like people are like, what should I do? Do what you can do. You know, exactly. you know what you can do. Let's exactly. let's go. We need you. We need you. Exactly. And that was a beautiful thing. I mean, when, when he showed up, you said, do you know your race? I'm like, no, I don't know that, brother. But I knew somebody that knew him, and somebody I trust, who I would trust with my life. And it's so funny how these, how these um, circles are very small. And folks show up in that spirit. And, they're, and, and, and whatever their skills are, they have the same spirit. And that's when you know, yeah, these are folk who are with us, uh, one of my and Kamal's closest friends and her sister friends and part of the sister circle that they created, Kimmy Amoyo and her family out of uh, Cincinnati. She is one of those board certified national teachers, brilliant master teacher, but an African centered teacher. She, her daughter, they, her husband, they've done so much work. But when she showed up, when I, when, when I was, met them, met her, you know, it's that same spirit. Everybody has different skills, but it's that same spirit. That's when you know. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, one of the glues, somebody that I couldn't do without um, in so many areas, he works in everything that I'm doing, he even back reads the global majority website, Ahmad, right? Came oh, yeah. rogue. He came rogue in class with Carr. <laughs> and, and Dr. Carr was like, you know him? I was like, nope. Uh, and I was like, you don't know me? That? So he was like, mm. Dr. Carr was like, mm-mm. Yeah, I'm always like that. Yeah, no, no. And I was like, well, let me let me talk to him. Let yeah, me see yeah, what, what, yeah. What are his intentions, you know, yes. because he was doing a lot. He was doing yes. a lot un, unsolicited. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and come to find out, he just cared that much. And he has, again, a certain set of skills that were absolutely, absolutely. necessary. Man builds websites. We have now Urban View Gives. He did that for me in a weekend, you know, oh. to, to highlight, you know, organization like just. He redesigned the hub. He's we're about to launch that in February. He's doing my I'm just like this guy uh, invaluable. But he came because he appreciated you every Saturday. Like it just wanted to be a part of something. Didn't ask permission. <laughs> Didn't ask permission. It's like I'm here and you're not gonna get rid of me. So <laughs> that's the beauty of the, the metronome. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, we have to have the in person. Contact, you know, it's so funny. We were talking about this. Um, maybe about 15 years ago, Mashriki was installed in West Africa in the Volta region. 
um, as a queen mother. Uh, Awusi Nomasi II is her is her throne name. Uh, following the steps of Dorothy Benton, who was known as the queen mother of reparations, the reparations movement, who was the leader of Encova for a time. But I'm mentioning that because <clears throat> these are not honorifics. Like a lot of people go and they pay money, they get a, and they say, oh, I'm a king ever, I'm a queen. It don't mean the same thing. When you're a queen mother, you, you then have to take on responsibilities. So her responsibility was a school. So they fund, uh, they're building a school and they built the school and they fund these children, particularly young girls to go to school. Now I'm saying I have to say that, you know, when you're doing that kind of work and we saw that, of course, the library there in Opobo that, um, that Aya and Nelly and her family are doing and then people are supporting, that's the tangible thing. But what we're doing this kind of metronome and this consistency, somebody like Ahmad shows up because we're there for him to show up so that we don't have a physical place yet like that. But this virtual space is not something that could have been imagined when Mashriki and them were building this school or when, you know, but now it enhances and enables all those physical places. And as we catch up to the physical We've got this place now that people can rely on yeah. and it has made all the difference. So somebody like Ahmad is, like you say, invaluable. And just to know that 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 people can now rely on this kind of consistency, particularly this is something we'll talk about in a minute, too. And, and what has happened and transformed over the last four years. I mean, you know, when you said, can I press record? We were deep in COVID. And then when we were in number 50, uh, we talked about revolution versus reform. We started that day. That was in December. We talked about Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. And, you know, th that day we talked about the fact that every time there is a move toward kind of transforming this system, the system tries to hold on a little longer. We talked about the impeachment trial in, in, in number 50 and the 1776 project, which was Trump and them's attempt to go at the 1619 project and now we have of course the heritage foundation with project 2025 see we, we 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 seem to forget while we move from thing to thing to thing these people remain consistent like a metronome you don't match like we talk about all the time individuals don't be institutions and metronome you need a metronome to beat people with a metronome they have long memory that's why today i thought it would be a good subject line to say you know days of future past you know, took that mm. from the back in the 80s, 1981. They did a two two issue comic run, and of course, they made it into a movie in 2014. This whole notion of there's gonna come a day when these sentinels have been improved and they put all these mutants in concentration camps and wipe everybody out. And the only way that they could fix it in the comics is to send Wolverine back in time to cut it off at the root. Well, we can't do that. But our version of going back in time is regaining the momentum of memory. So what we're seeing now with the Project 2025, with everything that's going forward with, uh, uh, um, I guess, Eddie Gloud and them and, and John Meacham and them went to the White House last week to meet with Trump, the historians he brings wait, in. Wait, uh, to meet with Trump? Not Trump. I meant to say, oh. uh, <laughs> ahead of myself. I'm thinking about next year. But anyway, they won't be invited back. They might be in some of those camps if, if Trump has his way, because he didn't told you what he's going to do if he gets back in concentration camps. He's saying the he's saying the loud part out loud. But yeah, we, with, 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 with Biden. And of course, we saw Biden give a speech uh, yesterday, you know, saying this is a fight for democracy. Yeah, it is. But let's be very clear. Without the momentum of memory, without that metronome. We talked about this 150 weeks ago, and we talked about the fact that this fight is about ideas, it's about education, and of course, 50 episodes later, 50 weeks later, we had the 100th, and that was that three hour and 54 minute piece where we, you know, we talked about that, and we talked for that last hour or so about Lift Every Voice and Sing, and, and, and about you know, that 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 stanza that begins with God of our weary years, God of our silent tears and how that generation, those generations that came through that trauma just knew that we would come and not forget and bring it forward. And here we are at 200. And we have to now recognize that January 6th, indeed, 2021 was huge and. January, they're planning on being sworn back in and putting a lot of those people in jobs. 
in January 2025. So, you know, they haven't forgotten. While we talking about Club Shay Shay and Cat and who clapped back, and Ludacris ran out and recorded a verse on Cat Williams and everybody talking. Q made a video. 20 million people come on. watching Cat Williams over a 48-hour period. And meanwhile, they didn't cut the whole head off the black president of Harvard. They going after MIT. They out here in the streets. And me, but what are we talking about? We talking about Saturday the Entertainer and Steve Harvey, a race of children if we allow ourselves to be that. <laughs> if we, so our metronome is more important now than ever. We can't let these people. Yeah. I mean, and anyone offended, I, I believe we can do multiple things. I walk and chew gum very well. So oh, I'm, no I watched two hours and 46 minutes and talked about it. And at the Me same too. time, talked about yesterday, Merrick Garland's speech, uh, which I thought was also interesting. Crime is down across the country, except for, uh, crimes against one another, <laughs> the, right. the racial crimes, the, those kind of the crimes against uh, public figures, the crimes against judges, which is really tells you a hint about the anarchy that we're in. If you can assault judges and lawmakers and people who are paid or that you've elected to serve you, that speaks more to where we are right now. And January 6th, that insurrection, you know, I think a lot of our work is bringing people together. That insurrection, I think, told us, was I think it was a dry run. I think it was a, you know, a, a draft of what's to come, to your point. They wanted to see what they could do. Well, they could I, I absolutely do everything, it seems, and just go in and uh, kill and steal and defecate and urinate and, and destroy. It's white and, no one, and no one did anything. That's well, like... There was, no, they, there was no National Guard. There was nobody being oh, shot. There was no tear gas. There was no... Yeah, there was no call, a national emergency. There was nothing. And we watched it all. We watched yep. it all, which means that if if the levers of power are in the hands of people that like insurrection, then um, the, what what would stop them from round, rounding us up and putting us in concentration camps? And Definitely. and what, what would stop them from denying you all your rights? And Because um, now they have the courts. They have the highest court in the land, Supreme Court, and the lower courts, because the previous president put a lot of people in those courts. They gerrymandered. Jerry rigged uh, many, several of those key states that, uh, you know, you need to win. And there's no Brett, Raff, what's the name, Raffensperger, Raffensperger in uh, Georgia. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no stop get Republicans anymore that are going to say, I have a conscience and I can't do this. Oh, and you have an insurrectionist as the Speaker of the House. Like, yeah. like an insurrectionist adjacent person. Let me say that. No, Alleged. Christian, Christian fascism. That part, that part. I mean, so, you know, I, mean, um, I, would say, I shouldn't say Christian, uh, Bible quoting uh, white nationalist right. who uses uh, or, or, or say Bible. Christians like this with the air quotes because, ah, <laughs> yes, yeah, Christian. Yeah, I mean, um, it's interesting these ongoing debates about society, the state, liberalism. When people say liberals, you know, it's not the the dictionary definition of liberal to talk about individualism, freedom, equality, which can be debated as to whether or not that should be the, the foundation of society either. It has its own edges and the pursuit of individual potential, all that kind of thing. But all those debates get, get lost in a society where the noise is constantly there. And there's, there's intellectual warfare going. When you go to the Heritage Foundation's website, and you click on Project 2025, they are not trying to hide. I heard you um, this week talking about that Harvard report that we talked about extensively. We went through that report and it had how you went through it and read it and discussed it on the, the history and legacy of enslavement and deeply flawed report. But even in its, and by flawed, I mean, uh, its recommendations weren't weren't even a drop in the bucket with somebody, as you said, uh, on, on serious with a on an institution with an endowment approaching fifty one billion dollars. The idea that you give a couple of nickels and partner with HBCUs and do some other stuff. You're not partnering. You're trying to get a hold of them documents you don't have digitized yet. So your scholars can continue to rewrite the history. But that having been said. Even with that, Harvard threw Claudine Gay under the bus so fast. That and, you, know, you see what they replaced her with the interim, yeah. The provost, 
Yeah, the provost is. I mean, uh, wait, what? What? What is? What? What is his claim? I mean, just, it just, you know, it's interesting. Um, there was a petition when I first got to Hunter to to remove me because I said some things on television. I was at uh, CNN at the time uh, on the Paula Zahn show, and I said something about atheists. Uh, <laughs> you know, me being cheeky, and oh my God, it was a, uh, so they had a petition in my department to remove me from my position. Wow. That I got a, a hold of. And it was fascinating as I'm reading because I was going up to people. This you? You signed this? You uh -huh. know Come you on now. Are you signing mm -hmm. something? You, you never had a conversation with me. How about you have a conversation? And then the, 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 the red face, you know, uh -huh. conversational. Um, but the person that they were replaced with. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm just, you know, some people might have, you know, got their lawyers involved. No, I went to each person that signed it and was like, is this you? How about having a conversation? You don't even know Let's me. You know, you trying to get me out of here? And the person that they were going to replace me with in a department, in a school that's one of the most diverse schools in the country, well, you're talking about children from everywhere, of all walks of life. But a department... No question. A department where I was the only black woman face, the wow. only one, they were going to replace me with a white man. And I oh, said... Boy. And, and most of those students have never had a black professor in their entire careers, in their entire careers, never. And so it was to me very important that they get to see a certain kind of black person sitting in the, at the front of the class, standing well, at the front of the class. Of the class. In the city university of New York. The most the diverse. Most diverse, no question. Working class, the class, the, not even class diverse, he's working class people. And these kids had never, mm -mm, mm -mm. And and I'm not saying that because I don't I don't believe in just you know having a black face there. But I'm a particular mm -hmm. kind of black person that you would want to have in a situation. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm I'm going deep for the culture, but also you know I'm giving you breath, you know, with a D in it. And I'm I'm like, oh, so you're gonna replace me with somebody that doesn't have my credentials? You know, I'm coming in with a Pulitzer or Polk Award, not like as a journalist, right? Come on, a working and, journalist. And, right. Yes, a, a person that has at that time like five New York Times bestsellers. Like, are y'all really serious? You gonna replace me with somebody? That was your recommendation because you didn't like something I said on TV. But this is supposed to be the bashing of free speech. So you know, I've understood long ago that academia was uh, interesting. It was more political than anything. But you know, watching this play out with Claudine Gay, all I could see say is like, you know, they're playing in our faces, and what are we gonna do about it? Is the question. Well, I mean, they, still gonna enough. hold, you know. Well, we, we, we're doing something with, with, with narrative. We're doing something with Nubia. As far as I'm concerned, they can have Howard. I'm Howard. <laughs> that wasn't 40 and slip. They can have Harvard. They can have the university. That's why we jailbreaking the black university. That was not a 40 and slip because they have always had it. See, understand the, these institutions were set up to replicate the class structures that they are attendant to. Now, you know, it seems there's almost, you can almost smell the glee. I don't, I, maybe not. And maybe I'm projecting, but when uh, Dr. Gay resigned, it seemed that most of the news articles that I read said that, you know, she was the first black and second woman in the history of Harvard to be the president. And she is the shortest tenured president in Harvard. And they, they, they found some glee and put it in 1638, I think, when John Harvard's plantation uh, paid for the university that now bears his name. And every time I go up there, I paid respects to his statue in ways that y'all know I would do. But uh, I think it was 1638, the shortest presidency. And I'm like, why would y'all? Okay. Okay. Is, is you get the kick out of saying this that y'all could. And yeah, um, it's not unusual when a president resigns or is fired or leaves suddenly for the provost, who is the chief academic officer, as we know, uh, of university of the university. Sometimes they call him vice president or her uh, vice president of academic affairs to be appointed as the interim until they have a search for a new president. And in this case, the interim, Alan Garber, uh, I think comes out of economics and does healthcare policy and stuff like that. He happens to be Jewish, um, which is incidental if you take into account the fact that usually it's the chief academic officer or the provost that will take over as the interim, the manager of the, because I understand the president of a university isn't the president of the academic stuff the president is the fundraiser the face of the university, all this kind of thing but the provost is the ones where we run in the course stuff the, the the colleges the deans and she was a dean in fact uh when she was appointed one of the critics uh some of the critics her critics um reflected on the fact that there were a couple of black men whose politics were quote unquote right of center 
um, Ronald Freyer, and I forget the uh, brother's name who was the master. I think they called him masters at Yale, but he was like the live in uh, faculty member at one of the dormitories, one of the houses, as they call them in Harvard College, the undergraduate dimension of Harvard University. And he was uh, uh, he's a lawyer. He was defending Harvey Weinstein and Gay was the uh, Claudine Gay was the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at, at Harvard and responded to that. I think there was a committee put together to investigate well, something or other. Anyway, in Freyer's, in Freyer's case, it was a charge of sexual harassment. They shut down his lab. He had one of MacArthur Grant, um, his research, his, he's an economist by training. His research kind of cut against the grain for a lot from a lot of conventional wisdom around affirmative action and things like that. And he was eventually reinstated to full time at the fa as faculty member of the faculty, tenured faculty. But he had been suspended, I think it was for two years without pay. And Gay was the one who signed off on that. And in the case of the other brother, uh, they took they took him out of the house where he had been the faculty kind of live in faculty member at this 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 house because he had chosen as a lawyer to represent Harvey Weinstein and the students said they didn't feel safe and, and so they took him out and when she was made president one of the little whisperings which I don't think amount to anything because you know they often say the running joke in academia is that no battle is too small that the battles between academics are tiny and their proxies for huge things on campus. When you leave the campus, like, well, y'all fighting over that? That's nothing. Where, where your parking uh, is, and I mean, anyway. But the critique was that, oh yeah, Claudine Gay will carry their water, by they meaning those in power. So she was a safe pick. And now that she's been excoriated, she only published 11 or academic articles over the course of her career and no single authored books. And of course, the running joke on that, Chris Rufo, this towering genius, uh, Rufo, uh, who was leading this, DeSantis's friend, they trying to destroy this school in Florida and they've gone pretty, uh, this new college, I guess, they've, they've done a pretty good job. Rufo has, he would often uh, trumpet the fact that he had a degree from Harvard. He has a degree from Harvard, a, a master's uh, from Harvard, um, no, Harvard Extension School. Yeah. Harvard Extension School. And people are quick to say, well, you know, Harvard Extension School, which isn't uh, part of Harvard University in terms of the same course offerings, this kind of thing. It's an extension school, but people say, well, you know, there are many universities that accept the credits from Harvard Extension School if you want to transfer credits, and that's true. Uh, there's one, however, prominent school that doesn't accept extension uh, school credits from Harvard, and that's, uh, what's that school? Oh, yeah, Harvard. Chris Rupo, who ain't wrote nothing, is the one questioning Claudine Gay's academic credentials. And, you know, she has found herself on the defensive. In fact, this was um, on, this was Thursday's, let me see, Thursday's New York Times had, if I have it here. Yeah, here we are. Thursday's New York Times. He wrote an op-ed, Claudine Gay. Uh, what happened at Harvard? is bigger than me. And I won't read much of it, just this first paragraph. She says, on Tuesday, I made the wrenching but necessary decision to resign at Harvard's, as Harvard's president. For weeks, both I and the institution to which I've devoted my professional life have been under attack. My character and intelligence have been impugned. My commitment to fighting anti-Semitism has been questioned. My inbox has been flooded with invective, including death threats. I've been called the N-word more times than I hear to count. And she wrote this to say, this isn't even about me. And of course she's being very magnanimous. Of course it's about you, you're a black woman. And of course, um, within the governance formation, again, thinking about our African studies framework, to the social structure that we live in, Claudine Gay did everything right. In, within the governance formation, there are different conversations. I've seen some little nasty comments having been made, being made about her because her family, her parents came to the United States from Haiti 
So people are saying, well, she's not black American. So she was against us. Um, again, I think about Mashariki Jawanza, who was born and raised in the United States, whose families came, came, family came through enslavement. And when you look at, uh, we did a interview over, a little over a year ago um, on the Black Table, the, the, the uh, show that I do on the Black Star Network with Mashariki and with Nkichi. And when you watch that interview, Mashariki makes the point that, you know, she is for the liberation of African people everywhere. Um, this whole descendants of, I don't call it descendants of slavery, descendants of slaves, because slave, slave is a mentality. To try to separate this sister out, uh, the people calling her the N-word aren't looking at the fact that her parents came from Haiti. Don't be silly. John Clark would often say, don't be mad, don't get mad, get smart. There is no sheltered rear when it comes to the ugly politics of race. So it, it's absolutely about her. She's going to bear the brunt of that. Now, um, of course, the billionaire Ackerman, who uh, wants to wants her now to lose her tenured position on the faculty of Harvard, while his own wife, who had a tenured position at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and more revelations are made every day about her documented plagiarism of her dissertation. Uh, not to mention the controversy uh, of a hundred and fifty thousand dollar donation to her laboratory at MIT. She's a practicing artist. Her artist's uh, studio from a uh, one Harvey Weinstein. No, Jeffrey Epstein. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Getting my predators mixed up. At any rate. Uh, yeah, he donated money to her artist studio. But at any rate, nobody's saying anything about the billionaire's wife who has all this documented plagiarism, and now he wants Claudine Gay to lose her job at Harvard. It's absolutely about race, you understand. Um, but she's saying in this op-ed, this, uh, this opinion uh, column in Thursday's New York Times that it's not about her. It's about the attack on institutions, on what she calls trusted institutions of all types, from public health agencies to news organizations, and that these institutions will continue to fall victim to coordinated attempts to undermine their legitimacy and ruin their leader's credibility. She's absolutely correct about that. Now I'm back over in the social structure categories. We're thinking about this in our 200th convening, 200th consecutive convening here. In, in this in this sacred space, as far as I'm concerned. And it is about undermining the institutions. This is what the Elise Stefanzics of the world, Congresswoman Stefanzik out of New York, and others are banging on the bottom of their metaphorical pots and pans trying to disrupt these institutions. They're going to go after Sally Kornbluth at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the same school where billionaire Ackerman's wife uh, plagiarized her dissertation but it's not about plagiarism it's about power and when you read project 2025 on the heritage foundation's website uh, they begin the introduction to the <clears throat> to the project says it's not enough for conservatives to win elections if we're going to rescue this country from the grip of the radical left we need both a governing agenda and the right people in place ready to carry uh carry this agenda out on day one of the next conservative administration. This is the goal of the 2025 presidential transition project. This project will build on four pillars that will collectively pave the way for a more effective conservative administration. They got a policy agenda. They have a personnel database. They're building the database. They have training. They train in these soldiers. And they have a 180-day playbook when they get back in. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, this is this is where this is where I'm going with it. Real time fascism in the context of electoral politics is, in some ways, an existential threat to us. In other words, it means that when you start, you know, people will say, "Well, the Democrats and Republicans are the same." Or they're not the same, but they might as well be the same. And if in a system is soft fascism, they're soft nationalists. I get it. I agree with all of the theoretical analysis. And I also find that many of the people who make that analysis think that they're safe from the worst of it. So what it means is when you start looking at, for example, a, a, a policy agenda, 
for something like Project 2025. And the fact that there will be, um, let's say that the Republican Party captures the White House. And let's say for a minute that certainly Donald Trump is the more offensive. And if you look at uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, he's ineligible. And the Supreme Court, by the way, has its work cut out for it because um, they announced yesterday that they're going to rule on the Colorado challenge. Uh, that's going to come up soon. Uh, the Colorado Republican Party has urged the justices to rule by March the 5th. John Roberts, as we talked about last week, is losing his mind because now you can't, you're going to have to face this. Did he or did he not violate the 14th Amendment? But let's say for a minute that, that, that he doesn't, he isn't the nominee and that it's Nimrata Haley or DeSantis. The important thing to understand is that's the titular head. That's the stuff that the late night comedians get to joke on or that we might comment on in passing. The real agenda, this Project 2025 business, the real agenda is institutional. And the people who are doing this, the billionaires who are funding them, the corporate entities that are supporting them, have another agenda. So what it means for us is that when the prices on everything goes up, because of monopolies, when people are arrested and detained without counsel or and then you go to the courts to appeal and you find that you don't have the rights that you thought you had, when you are looking for employment and the wages are, we saw on January 1st to, uh, of this year that uh, the real wages, the hourly wage rates went up in a, a number of states where they were able to pass uh, bottom line minimum wage raises throughout the country. But and you control the federal apparatus, you can suppress that kind of thing. Uh, when the GOP gets back in, those who are working toward retirement and, and counting on a little bit of their Social Security and they don't have much of a pension, if they have any pension at all, and trying to cobble together dignity for the rest of their lives, well, you can kiss that goodbye in Project 2025. You're going to privatize Social Security. And people saying, you know, get your government hands off of my health care. We ain't got to worry about that, hillbilly. Because they're going to take all the health care you thought you had. You hate Obama so much. Well, guess what happens when you don't have the Affordable Care Act? And we start talking about uh, uh, foreign investments, whether it be Homeland Security, Department of State, Intelligence Community. All those things are outlined what they want to do in Project 2025. So what it means for us is that it's going to be a lot more difficult to do the kind of work that we are doing right now. And for a number of people, those who don't have the luxury in many ways of sitting on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Monday or whenever folks are watching this and thinking through this with us and we're all working together, they don't have the luxury because they don't have a computer. They might not have a place to sleep. If they have a place to sleep, they're worried about their rent going up as property values continue to soar. If they're, if they're you know, over 60 percent of the people in this country have some investments in the stock market, most of it through our retirement accounts where the money is invested. However, I was just reading Financial Times yesterday. They were saying that the top one percent of people in this country economically control like 95 percent of the stock market. You Wait a minute. How is that part of the wealth in the stock market? Well, how is that possible if 60 percent of the people have something in the stock market? Most of us through our retirement, teachers, firefighters, police, wherever you work in public service have. Yeah. But well, how is one percent have over not close to 100 percent of the stuff? Well, that's because the wealth concentration has just continued. So folks who think this doesn't impact them are going to see in real time what happens when real time fascism in the context of electoral politics has taking the next leap. And it, it, January the 6th, 2021 is the visual. And remember, most of those people that stormed the capital of the United States of America were not poor. Understand? But in fact, there are a couple of them running for Congress right now to be part of this great retaking as this metronome continues. But we have to understand that these ongoing debates are not debates for people who are very clear about what their agenda is. We're the ones who are having a problem. Now, this week, uh, school starts back at, at Howard next week, and I was over to law school making sure that my the books that I ordered finally decided on and ordered 
for the critical race theory class that I'll start teaching beginning this week. And I thought about this prop. Um, I think that it may open a second uh, course in Nubia. I don't know. You think people might be interested in a, in a version of that critical race theory course uh, in Nubia? I'm thinking maybe since I'm going to be teaching it anyway. I'm, I heard a bunch of people say uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Very good. So I think maybe, I'll, you know, uh, it won't be the same as what we do because obviously these are law students and it gets very technical very quickly. But I think I can do a, a reconfigured version of it. But anyway, while I was over there, I was thinking about in conversation with, you know, some of the folks over there, you know, what does it mean to do intellectual work in a time of distraction? And we've talked about this, of course, with stolen focus and, and, and so many things. And when we started, we were in the pandemic. And as you often remind us, and as we, we really should reflect on, we were sequestered, we were quarantined and, and we were, we were still. And so there was time to absorb. And as you've noticed, as we've noticed over the arc of these 200 convenings, there are a lot, uh, there are a lot fewer books. There are a lot, and everything has been archived. So if you go back, you know, next week, of course, Martin Luther King holiday, I, I feel obliged to record something on Dr. King so that we can talk in the context of what has been going on. But we have a lot on King. You know, we talked about Jonathan Ogg's book on Martin Luther King. I'm looking over there because I, I read, read that in real time this summer. We talked about that. But, you know, when you're doing intellectual work in a, in a, in a, in a time of distraction, and we're trying to imagine a social structure, in, impacting a social structure that is inclusive, but not just inclusive in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion. It doesn't matter if the president of Harvard is white, black, polka dot. How does it impact collective benefit when we're trying to do that kind of work and we're all living in the social structures that we're in? You know, it doesn't mean when we talk about our African states framework, it's in many ways an artificial methodology to have us sharpen our thinking. It isn't a reflection of the quote unquote real world. We all live in the social structures we're in and we all have governance formations within those structures. Mashariki Jawanza and Mama Portia and all of them and Mama Kimi and all of them, Kabibi and all of them. They were living in the social structure of the United States of America and working internationally. But within that social structure, they were forming governance relationships with each other to move forward. So when Mama Portia was at the Children's Museum in Indianapolis and in Indianapolis Public Library, and they would have the big Kwanzas. Uh, I remember calling Mashariki uh, back in 2019 because uh, they sent me a message and I saw the cover of the Indianapolis Star. This, this is a white newspaper, of course, the flagship white newspaper in the city of Indianapolis. And on the front page was Mashariki Jawanza in her Ghanaian uh, uh, queen mother regalia, her kente dress, the dookie gold with the rings and the bracelets and all this. And it said queen mother of Kwanzaa. They had named her the queen mother of Kwanzaa in Indianapolis. This is a governance moment in a social structure. So we know that. So we're trying to improve the social structure we live in, reconfigure it, renegotiate it, all of that. As I said, in, in session 50, we talked about revolution versus reform. This is us trying to work through how to impose what we want on a social structure where other people are imposing what they want to the detriment of all of our people, all of us, not just black people in terms of our common humanity. Well, we have to remember in that structure that we have to curate and contemplate memory and critical discernment of the past. These are the days of future past. In other words, what we're seeing is not new. These are repetitive moments. These are cyclical moments. And if we don't remember, we talk about the momentum of memory. If we don't remember, we find ourselves having the same conversation over and over again while these people march on to our collective detriment. That's why the metronome is important. That's why the reliability of going week after week and then considering things in real time against things we've talked about. And that's why it's important to visit the archive, to go back and see, to spend time. You can spend as much time as you want in the archive and think through it. Now, in governance formations, with or without a state apparatus, let's say that they capture the White House again and continue to stock the judiciary because you can bet if the Republicans win, the presidential election in November, Clarence Thomas is going to retire. Sam Alito, that Christian soldier may leave, or he might be like Rehnquist, for my cold dead hands, you'll pry this robe. But you may pull a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in other words. But 
I would be surprised if they don't clean up Clarence Thomas. And then they'll put some 35-year-old lackey on the court, some black woman or man, and say, see, another black. And now you got a real problem. But our cultivated tastes are a problem in this. In governance formations, with or without state apparatus, how do, or even will we do, self-conscious thinking about ourselves? You know, our tastes are cultivated by algorithm. I watched, as you did, Prof, and so many of us, with fascination, this interview between uh, Williams and Sharp. Shan Sharp seems like a good brother. I don't know him. Never Have you ever had any encounter with him? Incidentally, I have not. not. I have not in my entire career. I have not. Okay. I, I just didn't, you know, I didn't know. Maybe you crossed the path with him. You know, Cat Williams is always out there on the road. He ain't lied about that. Cat, in fact, Cat Williams is very familiar to me in this sense. He could have gone one way, took another way. And when you see him in Richmond, Virginia, or Nashville, Tennessee, you see him at a civic center in Raleigh, North Carolina, or something like that, he ain't never left the road. He take everybody with him. I respect that. That's a that's a governance kind of way of moving through the world. And it creates a certain form of community that's very difficult to penetrate. And because of that, it, 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 it's very interesting to think about him because as a comedian, Cat Williams, of course, is in the profession, in the craft of irony. Now, here's a black comedian seeking comedy as kind of refuge, a refuge of resistance to oppression in many ways. And I think in some in some ways, I think Cat Williams, I saw somebody said this yesterday, the day before I laughed, said Cat Williams is who y'all want Dave Chappelle to be. <laughs> and I, laughed about, I laughed about that because I know you watched it. Come on, back. did you watch The Dreamer? Pro? I, I, I did. I watch. You know, I watch everything. I heard you. I heard you talk about it. I'm sorry. I don't know why I asked yeah. that question. No, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, wa I watch everything. Some things I fast you forward do. through while I'm doing other things, and some things I have to sit sit with quietly. You know, some some yes. TV shows yeah. and movies I have to sit with and digest. Um, I. So, so I, I love comedy. I grew up, you know, with that N words crazy. Uh, my parents had cry? every no. everything from Flip Wilson, the the last movie um, my parents and I went to together. I was a child. Was Mom's Mabley's last film. I remember when they used to have those big theaters. You know, my parents were into comedy. So, for me, from Robin, you know, you know, Bebe's Kids to the first Eddie Murphy album, like I listen to comedy, you know, George Carl. I listen to comedy. Um, Flip yeah. Wilson, I Flip Wilson doll that had Geraldine on the other side. My dad oh, bought no me Christmas and you, the devil made me do it. And you pull the string and something else, you know, so <laughs> I, am, I am, and, and because the dozens were on display in my home all the time. Yes. All the time. I mean, like brutal dozens, uh, I'm not sensitive to anything. And because I grew up a particular kind of way, I'm also always ready <laughs> to roast somebody. So I, I have, I've, I've been sharing with the audience. I have to uh, contain myself because, you know, people are very sensitive. So for me, I watched Dave Chappelle and what I saw with the first joke was mastery. The way he crafted that thing and the punch, I was like, oh, I did not see that coming. And it right. was brilliant. Now people right. are offended. And I get it. I get it. People are offended, but I, I don't run to offense. If you offend me, I'm not necessarily in his comedy. So you have to believe in his heart, like he wants to do harm and that his comedy creates an environment for people to do harm. People are going to do harm like what they did to Ahmaud Arbery. It's already there. It's already there. There's no amount of legislation. There's no amount of, you know, censoring. There's no amount of trying to shut people down that's going to change a culture of hatred. And to me, with Dave Chappelle, I think he gave everybody. I mean, he, Madison Carthen and all of the handicapped people, the differently able people, because I'm going to use the proper words, because I am not a comedian and very respectful, of, hopefully. How about that? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You know, but he he gave everybody something. So that's that's to me the tradition, and we should get back to that, where we should be able to laugh at everybody. So that everybody's in the same boat. And, you know, if you're a handicapped person or a differently able person laughing at the LGBT, you know, the trans jokes and you're a trans person laughing at that, then it's like, yeah, we are all. That's what I thought was his 
motivation with this particular special, which was so well written. I could see the writing in it, right? As Absolutely. a writer, and I'm like, Absolutely. that was well done. Absolutely. And I also think that two hours and 46 minute Cat Williams interview was also stand up. Oh, no perfectly question. Crafted, perfectly crafted. Absolutely. He clowned everybody, including yeah. Shannon. I, to his face. And Shannon didn't even know. A few times I was like, he Shannon, didn't even know. Straight. Can, Bruh. He just caught a straight. No, he caught a straight. Yeah, I, I love I love the staccato sports references. <laughs> he kept bringing. I'm like, man, this dude is, bro. Listen, can you hear? Come on, man. This this ain't skill. This ain't skill. <laughs> this is the dude who brags about the fact that he's like in Mensa and all this. And Cat Williams is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I, you know, and as an interviewer, I was a little, I was jealous. You know, at some points I was like, oh, this question you should ask. But again, you, you, you know, you. Water seeps its own level. This was an opportunity. This is why Shannon had to be quiet, you know, in many places. There, there couldn't be a follow-up because he didn't even, he wasn't even ready for a lot no. of the things that Cat Williams was saying. No. Like, no. so it was like, oh man, it was, it was, it was masterful to watch. I, I enjoy both of them. So of I don't know. How, yeah, how no, I would agree too. I would agree too. I, I think it's interesting as you talk about it, don't think about, you know, Dave Chappelle clearly could do could go in that direction. I mean, how do you speak to multiple? audiences. Chappelle clearly is speaking to a number of audiences. You know, Cat has decided to do something else in a different way. And then you think about people, of course, like your friend Roy Wood, who's just masterful as masterful. well at being able to speak yeah. to multiple audiences, you know, and more like a poly, like a wonk. It's a wonkish kind of humor and a no, great story. Let me tell you, Roy, <laughs> Roy comes with a notebook with the hot topics already laid out. He knows what is... That man is preparation personified. He knows he, he studies. He's watching, you know, uh, Dave is political as well. You know, I mean, they're all just really smart. Comedians are some of the smartest people. You're not going to find too good many. Com- well, sure. The good ones. Right. Let me just preface that. The really <laughs> like good comedians, else. Yeah. <laughs> like anything the, else. Right. The really good comedians, because you have to be able to decipher what's going on in the world and make it make it relevant, make it interesting, pull out that one little thing like the gnarled hand that nobody was looking at, the gnarled fingers, and now everyone's looking at your gnarled finger. You know, like that's right. that's the genius of comedy, taking those little moments that no that's one's right. checking for and then bringing them to the hot, to the forefront and no, then trying to make right. them funny. I mean, it's- That's absolutely mm. right. That's absolutely right. I mean, it, it, it becomes a situation, like say, we think about that in the context and then within kind of governance formations, those comedians who have applied that creative intelligence kind of inward to black communities where the jokes just go over the heads of so many uh, who outside of those communities. Again, that makes a Roy Wood and a Dave Chappelle that much more, um, you know, that's much more impressive to be able to maintain that while at the same time bringing in the common humanity. And, And that's not to say Cat Williams doesn't do that. But then if you go further into the governance center, Somebody like Earthquake, for example, who, you know, you if you, you had to be careful with Earthquake because you will you will literally not be able to breathe <laughs> with that kind of staccato, like a joke within a joke within a joke within a joke. Like, how are you doing this, man? I can't breathe. Stop talking. We need it all. We need it all. We need it all. We need it all. We absolutely need it all. But I, I, I'm thinking about that in the context, though, of this moment, and I'm glad you brought up Shannon Sharp in this context, is again, thinking about what we're doing. And we're not the only people doing it. In fact, from the first time we were together, and then the 50th time, then the 150th time, and that a 200th time, you know, the first time we were together, it's club quarantine. We talked about that, in fact, in number 50. We talked about the fact that, hey, where is versus and then by by 100 and then by 150 versus not a thing anymore it's been colonized you know it's got a event and it, but people were all into it when they had nothing else to do but the distraction comes in and now of course we're in the potosphere everybody with a camera got an upload and shannon sharp you know when we were at number one he has a club shay shay playing around the edges but he's with skip bayless this is undisputed and now he is the I'm not going to make a comparison because there's no comparison. And Cat Williams made that clear at the beginning. People say, well, yeah, I'll come talk to Larry King. man. He'll talk to the white man, not the black man. Hold on. No, 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 no. Listen to what he is saying. He's kind of saying, you're not a professional, (laughs) but I'm going to talk to you because 
this is you let all them other people come in here so let me come in and kind of uh I say take it to another level and talk but anyway i'm saying i have to say that since everybody is out there you know we don't have the seventy five thousand, the fifty thousand a week who are coming in and check it out the the forty thousand a week but between 20 25 thousand or more a week coming into it and then nubia continue to build what has been revealed is there is the core this is exponentially more people in consistent conversation and thinking than we don't have a precedent for this we don't have a mega church no oh, please jump so, in yeah please so I, I did a on purpose uh <laughs> i took one uh clip from cat williams that wasn't you know making the rounds you know because everybody's making the 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 the, the battle the battle rap rap battle you know yeah oh steve this and that and i took one clip and then i did a riff that had nothing really to do with cat williams and more to do with us because that's usually the way that i'm you know but because of the algorithm and cat you know cat is so you know popular right now that video has like 180 000 views which i don't normally get on my mm -hmm. youtube channel now let me just say this too, you know, even with Nubia narrative, the goal was never to be, um, to go viral. Right. You know what I'm saying? The goal was never to be popular. The goal was even on the radio. When I came into Sirius, I just wanted to go fishing in that $26 million pond for the people who could hear what I was saying and yeah. understood what the message was, right? And yeah. so I would just be consistent with that message and the people would come and they would share. I don't do any marketing. We're not putting out any commercials. We're not out there telling people to come every day. We're not doing any of that because it needs to build organically, especially in these first five years, right? Because yes. that's the vision, right? So if we, if we got a 50 year plan with this, which we do. Um, the first 10 years is building organically with the people who are gonna lay down those cornerstone bricks yes. because you can't build a foundation that's shaky where the bricks got too much sand, not enough sand, not enough straw. They're in, they're faulty. By the time you get to year ten, the whole building's lopsided, looking like the tower piece or whatever. Uh, <laughs> Lena <Tower. laughs> uh, and, and so I, I was very intentional about that. But even you know, with the algorithms, you could do every video capturing the algorithms with the titles, with the thumbnails, with the you know, like there's a way that you can freak That's everybody. People who are on YouTube, they build there's whole you know YouTube channels on how to build your YouTube channel, right? No question. If you no want to do that, that's fine. If you want to be an influencer, there's a way to do that because we are sheep, most of us. No number. There, there is a very narrow is the road that leads to salvation. Very few will travel it. That's what I'm led by. And those who are on that road to salvation is not a lot of us. No question. And you hear things that other people don't hear. Those are the folk that are building narrative in Nubia. And so while sometimes the team was like, what do we do to get more people? I'm like, just be consistent. They'll come because their, their soul will be moved to come. And just that's the goal. That's so exactly we just gotta right. be consistent. So just be consistent. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I, I love the, the kind of organic way that we are growing. I mean... Monday night, we're going to do the attorney Salenti, the, the, the Du Bois conversation. I'm very much looking forward to that. You know, this many, in fact, I got my got my narrative Du Bois going on. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thinking about that and we'll talk about that in a minute as we kind of wind, wind, begin to wind to, 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 to close this off. But, you know, there's something, as you say, very organic about the common denominator in a society where we don't take time to think. And yeah, you know, where comedians take risks. I didn't like that Gaza gesture that, that Cat Williams made, but I understand, you know, he's he's taking a risk. And somebody mentioned that in in in, in the Nubia chat. I think Philip, you know, bombed the rubble. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an aggressive kind of thing. In a week where the Israeli Supreme Court didn't put itself out of business and Bibi Netanyahu now uh, in the middle of uh, the war that has been declared and consistent as people continue to die, can't escape his domestic problems that preceded the war. But this common denominator that we have in this society of not taking time to think, of getting caught up with Kim and Kanye, getting caught up with whatever joke stealing and all this kind of thing, it's easier. That's, that's low-hanging fruit to apply our intellect to. But what we have is a space where we have time to think, to absorb, to contemplate, to invest time, regular, continuous, 
connected, sustained focus. That's what allows us, us to soften problems, to soften them and to solve them, and then to come together through that focus. The result is, you know, we live in a society where, you know, like you said, everybody now uploading, talking, and it gives the appearance of deep thinking without deep thinking. You can't do deep thinking quickly. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when you see, like you said, when you see a Roy Wood, when you see uh, a Cat Williams, when you see these types of comedians, you know, and it's very striking that you talk about that I was watching. And, you know, I don't think that I, I would prefer a Shannon Sharp to say a Tere. <laughs> I'm going to say less. But I saw an interview with her, Roy Wood and Tere. Hold uh, on. Wait, me too. All right, okay. <laughs> you know, I know. See, that says something for you to say that because I'm not it right. Okay, good. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. no, please. This is great. This is what we're doing. That's what I'm saying. You know, uh -oh. I'm thinking just, about what you're saying. That's so I can see it. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. But you know, because I don't, I don't want, I don't want that. Because again, this is not conflict. This is well, it's not conflict. It's not this conflict. is how, how we have been conditioned to they push people on us. Yes, they, they present this narrative about who people yes. are. They're going to tell you who are the journalists. Yes. And it's just because somebody likes somebody. Exactly. It's nothing to do with somebody's actual skill and craft, right? You know, exactly. skill and craft, it, it takes time to build the skill and craft. No, you're not just no, going to no, do it because no. you have a pretty face and you're able to read a teleprompter well. This is time put in and relationships built. The one thing I can say about Shannon Sharp is he, his relationships are strong. They're oh, no long. Problem. They are cultivated over time. He put his work in, whether it was drinking and screwing or whatever he was doing with these people. <laughs> is, the bond is real. Do you know what I'm saying? It's real. It's not, it's not somebody with a microphone as I was in my 20s going into a locker room talking to people with no connection. Mm. But 20 years later, it's a different story. Because you know what I'm saying? That. And there should be some respect for that time put yes. in, but also the forged relationships that that builds you into something. As I look even at Nubia, you know, I was having this conversation with my producer, and I'm sorry. Um, but I you know, I reach out to people who are doing things. And I'm have a lady on on Monday and she was like, well, I'm not famous. I don't have a publicist. I'm like, yeah, but you're doing the work. Right. Can we stop, can we stop going after the publicist people and just go look for the people who are doing the work? I want you on to talk about the work you're doing. She's like, well, I'm not, I don't have a following. Who cares whether you have a following? You're doing the work, right? Like even that language, right? Following. Even in publishing, when when they publish books, they look at the numbers that you have, and that is the value of whether or not they're going to publish a book. Do you have a million followers? Because they don't want to have to work to find the audience. They want you to already have had it and built it, so that they can just you know press the the button as if that's going to matter. Because we know a lot of y'all's favorite with a lot of followings don't sell books because books no. are for readers. Right, right. Not not for clout chasers. Books are for people who actually read. So it's um it's fascinating to me. I hate it. I re I reject it roundly. The the pick me people that are placed before us with you know limited skills and backgrounds, who are who are favorites of the folk because they fit a a, a profile that the algorithms say that the, the America's gonna like. Yes. As opposed to COVID. like even in Nubia, you think about, you know, from the Jarvis's to the Zans to the Cheryl's, who's going to annotate every single word that you're saying, every book. No one asked anybody to do any of the things that no. they're helping that, you know, Tasha's coming in. Doing, you know, it's like right. there, there are so many people who I didn't know before. And I'm always constantly looking for people. I'm combing the Internet yeah. for people who are doing the work because I want to know. You know, and you know, we get inundated by publicists and all of the all of the publicists, all of the famous people. Um, I had Danielle Pinnock on. Um, she's mm -hmm. a woman that's on a TV show called Ghost. Cause she yeah. makes she makes me laugh. She did a bed bug in Paris <laughs> parody during the strike because yeah. she's like, look, the checks weren't coming in. I gotta make my own way. I got it I right, no question. The, they told her um, she didn't have enough following. She got like 38,000 people on Twitter. Like, I never look at people's Twitter following. I know I know talent. And you're no not going to, you know, drive talent based on having millions of followers. That no doesn't question. matter, right? No so question. we got to get out of the appetite that's been shoved into our, our psyche and start yeah. to really value, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I just had to say that. But yes, no, I agree. Not, with no, 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 that's not, no, this is the conversation. This is the dialogue. I mean, this is this is this is the value in this space. I mean, when I mentioned to Ray, I thought about it in the context of Roy Wood saying to Ray that he keeps 
his writing. He's always right. And then so when you said he's got this book, and of course Dave Chappelle said, Y'all will be fine. My jokes are in a safe deposit box. In other words, these aren't, you know, these are these are thinkers who are doing that work. And, and readers. And readers. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, people clown and Cat Williams said, you really think he read 3,000 books a year? I thought to myself, he's making a point. Y'all are thinking literally. And if they're children's books, I wouldn't put it past. I mean, but, but you don't know. But what he's saying is, I read a lot of books. <laughs> I mean, don't don't get caught up in the delivery. And, and and like you said, when he said, you know, do you know anybody just show up in Hollywood and all the movies Kevin Hart made are movies that I scripts I passed on. He's, he's hating on Kevin Hart. No, you know, Philly's my adopted hometown. Kevin Hart from Philly. People in Philly who love Kevin Hart don't deny the fact that he just showed up out there. Now, you know, he and then Cat Williams talked about being he, knowing Nick Cannon since he was a kid and kind of making spaces for Nick Cannon. And he's in the kitchen and the kitchen. I tell, I tell Nick, I'll tell, I say, man, look, the one thing that your friend, see, Kevin Hart is his friend. I said, one thing your friend does that I like, because I can't really watch Kevin Hart because of what you said. I mean, y'all made this guy. I'm not mad at him. This ain't got nothing to do with him. It's got everything to do with social. But that real housewives, of Holly, a real house husbands of Hollywood, real husbands of Hollywood, that's, 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 that's gold because y'all playing yourselves. It is a parody that I think is. It's extremely brilliant. entertaining. If yeah, you if yeah. you stay in that role, fine. I don't need to see you in a dress and no holding cell for no uh think like a man, whatever. But in that real husband's of Hollywood, that yeah. right there, it's like they all get a chance to be who they are, but pretend like they, there's something in that. So everybody has their place, but but to the point you're raising, these people pick winners and losers and then try to make us believe it just happened. And Cat Williams was puncturing that lie. <laughs> which is very important. So I, I, I saw you kind of, yeah, let me see how much I want to say about yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, but, I mean, but the beauty of this space is, you know, it's momentum of memory, but it's also hopefully modeling and hopefully inspiring people to want to come to their own conclusions. You know, you drop breadcrumbs, you, you're going to drop a full meal of breadcrumbs during, mm -hmm. you know, during the course of these 200 episodes, there are so many different rabbit holes people can go down on their own. But it's really about coming to a conclusion that hasn't been foisted upon us. I mean, for a group of people, particularly those of us like you and I who have ancestors that were in bondage, you know, we've had 400 years of being conditioned to not be ourselves because to be your full self meant there was a consequence. We talked about it with Fred Douglas, and I can't let that go. That right. even the debauchery, the drinking, the entertainment, all of that was on purpose to keep oh, us in perfect. a certain diminished place. And if we're going to accept that, you know, I was looking at the Club Shay Shay and the cognac and I was like, even that. And I know he sold out. That's his cognac. So there's a part of me that, you know, I was like, mm, that's really, really smart marketing. <laughs> you're selling your own cognac, but you're selling cognac to us. No question. Again. You know, so no so I'm like, you know, I got different ways. I almost, ways felt, of which... I almost felt sorry for him when he's look when he when he's laid back on the couch. Oh, Lord. I ain't going to have no show. In other words, <laughs> because you're right. Man, these people that backing me, they going to watch this. And then what did Cat Williams say? Oh, no, Oprah coming. I'm opening it up. No, as Cat Williams can see, they don't care about you, man. It's the spectacle. You're, you're yeah. just fine. <laughs> but, 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 but that moment, as you say, he was he got scared. He was like, oh, Lord, I ain't going to have no show. <laughs> but that Kanye, right. He's smoking them cigars. He's going to drink that cognac. He's going to do what he do. He's on there with uh, Chad Johnson, because I refuse to call somebody by a number in Spanish. And at the same <laughs> time, man. I mean, it just, I mean, at some point, you just got to draw a line. But, right. uh, you know, but, but to what you're raising, we have been turned into spectacles. Yeah. And when you turn people into spectacles, what we're doing here, we love that, that metaphor, that clean glass of water. You know, we're not going to be distracted. Let's just do this very slowly, very accretively, and people are coming, and the people that are coming can enjoy laughing at whatever they laugh. Yeah, I, some people are saying in the chat, I'm not into Kevin Hart either, but it doesn't matter because we're here too. 
you like you said, you could be a lot of things at once as long as you don't lose focus. That's right. And, and, and let's stay out of offense. I see somebody, I, I nothing wrong with a little libation. Yeah, drink, do what smoke, drink, whatever. But ask yourself right. why? Why do you why are those ads in our community? Why to see Dolores Tucker and Calvin Butts whitewash over the ads in our community? Because they're not in anybody else's community. They're, no. they're not McDonald's and, and Burger Kings and Wendy's on each corner in other people's community. Why are they in our community? So if you if you really are about this liberation thing, ask yourself, why do you like the things that you like? Because it doesn't oh. just, you don't come out the womb liking cognac and Hennessy and all that and yeah. smoking. You don't, you don't come out the womb. And are those things beneficial is the other That's question. Right. How does That's it free right. us? But also what is it doing to your body? And this is not to me, you know, wagging a finger, but if on the plantation you were uh, excoriated for not participating in the merriment. That's right. You were plied with alcohol and right. sports and that's if you right. didn't participate you might have gotten a beaten that's right why is and that it, because they knew in fact i'm glad you raised this because something else that douglas doesn't mention in that passage that we read but it has been documented over the course of scholarship researching what happened during enslavement among our people that period between christmas and new year's that week was where you saw the, esc the escalation of escapes in other words, they wanted them drunk. They wanted it because this was the period when they expected them not to work. And this is when them the girls ran off. <laughs> like, like, okay, you can go visit your wife on the other plantation. You can look up and both of them gone with the kids. What the hell happened? So part of this whole strategy of keeping them running foot races and being drunk, you got to watch them because we get them that week off, they are out of here. That's so important to understand. So as twenty Project 2025 is mounted, yeah. it needs us to be uh, not sober and it needs us to, right. to be at each other to, to be divided to be right. you're fighting over passports and you know women and men and and foundational versus they need all of that right, that's right. because that's, right. that's how they win as long that's as we right. are fighting with one another over dumb stuff and even the you know kevin hart and steve hart none of that is freeing us who cares i free. skip right over that into him paying and Dion cole let me shout out to him because he get yes he a very heartfelt he was one of those young comedians that That's wasn't right. getting paid because comedians, young comedians get paid in drinks. Let me just say that too, as a person that has been in rap, they get paid in drinks. Teach, teach. Okay. Teach. They're not getting paid real money early on. Come on. Ooh, which is why some of them, most of them, a lot of them are alcoholics and drug yeah. addicts. Come Cause on, that's, man. that's, that's the, that's the commerce, right? Come on, come on. Cap was giving them cash. Cat was giving cash anonymously through these women that he would just like when when uh Sienna said women would just show up with bags of money and just give to people and you wouldn't know where it came from. <laughs> when he talked about tithing, you know, if I get a hundred thousand dollars in a community, I'm gonna give ten thousand to a homeless, you know, you know, homeless. because I was I'm like, that's that's the that's the Kwanzaa principles, you know, that we should be that's giving out right. with, with each other. I don't have any problem with that. So, you know, no. as we are you know, heading headlong into God knows what. I have no idea what 2024 is going to bring. I don't know who's going to be the nominee. I don't know who's going to lead this country. I know there's going to be a lot of wars. I know there's going to be this conflict is going to increase, whether we're talking about Uganda, Congo, Haiti, United States. That's the, right. It's not going to get any better, but we got to be head on a swivel and sober and united. That That's I right. know. That's right. And the things that we know are coming as distractions, we can better manage them. You know, I mean, we can and we can do that. And you're absolutely right. It just had an election in Congo. Uh, it it wasn't clean. It might have even been stolen again. Shishiketi is back in for this Shishiketi. But, you know, and within this calendar year, they're going to be over 70 elections in different countries around the world. And we're not just focusing on presidential politics, of course, but but to make the point, you know, to reinforce it. I mean, we have to continue to ask ourselves in 2024, we must always ask ourselves, what are the limits and possibilities of the state, of the society that we live in, wherever we are in the world? And we know that we are a global community here. That means that, you know, South Africa, the elections are coming up, you know, radical inequality there, social, economic inequality. People are suffering in South Africa. You know, Jack uh, hasn't checked in in a while. Jack, come on in. Well, on should, all the in yesterday. Here. She was she Did was she, in with Sam Reynolds. Yeah, she came in. Oh, good. Uh, she was good. Very good. I'm glad to hear that. Excellent. Because, you know, I mean, it's important for us to remind ourselves that the societies we live in are artificial in the sense that they are human created. We can always change the society. 
What are the possibilities and limitations? And what of our struggles to what what do our struggles teach us? What do they have to teach us about how we build beyond those horizons? We're building something. We're participating in something that isn't impacted by the state. We make different kind of decisions. And, you know, like I said, we've seen these before. Theta said something uh, in the Nubia chat a little while back about the 1930s and 40s. And certainly we see the purge of, uh, of scholars like Max, Yer well, Max Jurgen, kind of his politics were a little bit all over the map in some ways. Paul Robeson and the the, the attacks, we've talked about Paul and, and S.E. Robeson and, and these attacks that happened on them, Shirley Graham and W.E.B. Du Bois. We've seen that purge. We know what 2024 holds because we've seen it before. You know, somebody mentioned Claudine Gay. Maybe she should be at an HBCU. Mm, no, because because the people at HBCUs want to be at Harvard with, with some exceptions. Let's be clear. The model doesn't displace when you drap, when you drape it in chestnut and uh, walnut and honey uh, and drape it in French vanilla and chocolate. No, when it's black, if it's a black faced version of white, Claudine Gay is exactly where she should be. We need black folk, all those places. But guess what? Self-determination looks different. We're not propping up those systems. Um, and it's important you know, to understand that. And that's not being uncritical. Marcus said something, I think he was in the YouTube chat about, you know, Cat Williams mentioned in Farrakhan, was like a father to him. Okay, people can acknowledge that and be critical of Louis Farrakhan. The last time I saw the minister, in fact, was with my Sharikin, and we were in Detroit at the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations, and, uh, and Cobra was in Detroit, and the nation came, and Farrakhan gave remarks. Greg Mathis was there. We were all standing there on stage after he finished his remarks. I'm standing there next to my Sharikin, in fact. Everybody was there. The thing is, you can be critical of the Nation of Islam. You can be critical of all that with while at the same time acknowledging that self-determination is at the heart of that organization. I was watching uh, the 10th anniversary of the Million Man March. They had a meeting at, at Howard Law School and all these black nationalists and Pan-Africans were there. And this is when Chokwe Lumumba was alive. Chokwe, another very good comrade, Mashrigis. Chokwe said, you know, he had to catch a plane. So they gave him a few minutes to make some final remarks as he was leaving. And he said, look, let me be very clear. Reparations. We are owed reparations, whether we ever get it or not. But the demand is what's important. And then he goes on talking about reparations. And he said, now, all you people saying what America will or won't do, it's on C-SPAN if y'all want to watch it. He said, first of all, y'all call yourselves Americans. I'm an African. I am not an American. And this Negro from Detroit lived in Mississippi. His kids are down there, Antar and, and Rukia from Mississippi. You know, but you can be many things. And I'm saying all these people who are trying to tie ourselves to this nativist logic, you are restricting yourself to the limits of the state. And he and he went in. He said, this is the stupidest thing. He says, like Malcolm said, if a cat has kittens in the oven, you don't call the kittens biscuits. Why are y'all calling yourselves? I mean, I mean now this is so, a Say that, so say that. Cameron, uh, Cameron and Mace. This is another, uh, the fact that anybody can have a microphone. That don't, people don't. The don't really, fear. No question. Oh yes, my God. He was like, "I'm not an African American. Them Africans don't even like us." And I was like, "Come on, come on. Ah. tell that to tell that to Ada Soje. Tell it to all of us who spend time on the continent and all the Africans. Tell it to you know to I and her children and Ken and their children. Tell it to y'all. Gonna stop doing that, or you're not. Ignorance is fine." We are human beings. We are hardwired for ignorance. But let's be clear, it's <laughs> also deadly. You know what I'm saying? I mean, in other words, we can we make bad choices. But look, like you said, in the potosphere, we can't, you know, you know, there are no degrees of separation. We know that the same person that would say that has somebody in their lives who thinks the exact opposite, who has taken care of them. And with a little bit of love and a little bit of exposure and a, and a clean glass of water pour in place, they can be brought into the religion. Like, yeah, you said that and you said it to a person who migrated here from somewhere else and you didn't even stop to think that you're talking about them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they love you enough. Because Mason's like, how do I process this right now? Right. I saw Mason. Oh, by the way, I did... Um, Mason Beth's book too. So, um, yeah, see, I'm, see? I'm, I'm come on now. Yes, yes, yes. It was a great book. Um, 
So, um, so, so you know, you know what he was. You know what. He was. And I know that Mace Mace has read a book or two. I know that yes. too. Um, but you know, yeah. their 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 podcast is very popular, and people are making a lot of money on these uh, YouTube a lot and of podcast money. spaces. So, so a the more controversial, money. the better. The more that's how you get the likes and the clicks and the algorithms. While we sit with a couple, you know, twelve hundred and on, on the YouTube side, we don't have twelve hundred likes. Um, you know, because it's not intuitive. People are sitting and enjoying. Well, you know, let's freak the algorithm. Let's be more intentional. Yeah, Those of you in Nubia, oh, yeah. come over yeah. and just yeah. hit the thumbs up because, you know, you can. Yeah. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, that's how we, you know, change some things by being intentional. Uh, but as you were talking to, I was thinking as I digest content, I'm picking out the things that are valuable. So like out of that two hours and 46 minutes, somebody mentioned it, Melba Moore. Cat Williams was going to get a star. He was like, no, let me honor an, uh, a person who is not an ancestor, but who has done some things and been overlooked because in Hollywood, she did not fit the model person that I know from Jersey. I remember her in Clifton Davis. You know, like I grew up with Melba Moore and Freddie Jackson. And to her, for her to get her star because Cat Williams saw her, we, we have to do that better. That's that connection. Him adopting all of those children. Yes. We, those children are our children and to, to not allow for us to, to be separated that way. There were some moments in that interview that I was like, those, those are teachable moments. Yeah. We got to honor the people who aren't getting the attention. Uh, if, if they want to bestow it on us, is there somebody else that is deserving that's not getting the attention because this is the only way ancestors and people who are alive continue to be relevant. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Next Absolutely. week, Tina, Tina McElroy Anson is going to be joining us. And I reached out to her because she's a Sea Island legend, but she's also, you know, one of our, she said to me, you know, I, I just, I, I'm in my seventies and I don't want people to forget me. And, you know, she's working on her sixth novel. And I was like, not as long as I'm breathing. I know and that's right. I'm not I know that's right. Yeah. So not we're going to be working it. together. Yeah. We're going to be working together in 2024 to make sure. Tina McGowan. But that's our responsibility, though. Those of us who have platforms, right? Those of us who it are is. Well, it, it is. Yeah. And, 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 it, and it's you're paying that honor, but also keeping that alive, that 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 name, that work alive and connecting to those ancestors. Those especially, you know, not I want to say especially the Gullah Geechee and the Sea Island folk. But Tina McElroy answer is so important to our culture and she should never have to think that. And doesn't have to think that because you're going, like you say, not as long as you're breathing. And that means not as long as we're breathing right along with you because the space has been created. And, and sometimes it's rough. You know, I'm seeing, I saw, I see my man, Baba MZ, in the uh, in the YouTube chat out of Detroit, mentioning Baba Chokwe, Mama Joanne Watson, Reparations Ray Jenkins, Detroit. I say he's a, that is a Detroit man, a legend, my, and, and my big brother. I love that brother. But right before him, Lao Tzu said, Grand Rising, that the car has jokes in the year 532 of the Ma'afa. Uh, the Nation of Islam, an example of self-determination. Really? These are the cats growing reeds on their farms in Alabama. I think uh, I embrace that fully. Um, and I would just say that uh, that is absolutely not true when you, I think of members. And I think we probably all know members of the Nation of Islam, like the ones I'm about to name. Um, Sister Callie and um, Brother Howard X in Columbus, Ohio, members of the, in fact, founding members uh, of the African Center with the, with the Kelsey family and many others. Um, these are Africans who uh, have given and gave their lives for the liberation of our people wherever they we found them. I mean, that's where I met Queen Mother Moore was there because of the African Center. And when I think about the members of the Nation of Islam there, Omar Ali Bey out of um, Cleveland, you know, when I think of uh, Abdul Aleem Shabazz, the great Dr. Shabazz out of D.C., Dunbar High School, Lonnie X, as he was known in the Nation of Islam, the great mathematician who at one time had trained over half of the mathematicians of African descent in the United States of America, went on to get PhDs, uh, Rodney Muhammad in Philadelphia, uh, Lazo, uh, I would say that you're absolutely incorrect. And that's fine. We should we should have that conversation. You come into Nubia and we can talk extensively about that. We should talk extensively about that. And that isn't to discount or in any way minimize the idea uh, that there none of our institutions, including the Nation of Islam, are without or beyond critique and beyond analysis. That's absolutely necessary. We have to do that to grow. But uh, let's be very clear, whether it's the Shrine of Black Madonna, whether it's the Nation of Islam, you know, uh, we're talking about institutions that are dedicated to self-determination. And, uh, you know, when we start uh, being so sure in our declarations of what people are and aren't and what organizations are and aren't, 
I think that's where we, 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 we show a kind of laziness of thinking. And again, this is important. What we're building here is essential. We kind of wind this up in 20, as we think about 2024, what we're building being essential, a community engaged in that slow learning, reflection, dialogue, and finding common kind of projects to engage. None of us are members of all the organizations, but we in this collective have enough people who are, have different forms of engagement. I saw a, uh, our friend and sister, Miss Higgy, says she started a reading group down there in Florida around uh, our brother Mike Harriet's book, Black AF History. And, you know, you see the churches and other institutions, and in this case, individuals bringing folk together to study. That is how we return to the momentum of memory that our ancestors gave us. We invented reading and writing. And when we went through this recent period of trauma, we never abandoned our intellectual work and we came out of that determined to build and rebuild our institutions. So when we think about all the people who made transition in the last week or two, we talked about Kamal Kambon, uh, Mama Jahari uh, uh, Amini is having uh, one of the founders of Third World Press and goes back, one of the editors, in fact, of Black World and Black Books Bulletin made transition. I saw uh, Haki Mabudi and, and Mama Spisha Mabudi announced there's a ritual, I think, taking place uh, early next week, a uh, memorial to her. We think about the genealogies of ancestors. I saw, of course, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. I was talking with Ajua yesterday about her, uh, who made sudden transition uh, in Texas. I think her ritual is is this weekend. Uh, Gregory Hines, of course, we know. Uh, uh, Ma well, I mean, not Gregory Hines, Maurice Hines. Maurice, yes. Yeah, Maurice, of course. And of course, I think about that because he's Maurice Jr., of course. We, we think about Gregory Hines, but we think about his brother and, of course, their father and all of the things that Maurice Hines did after walking away from dance for a time to build institutions. And then comes back that famous scene in Francis Ford Coppola's The Cotton Club, <laughs> where they two did those two are dancing together. And then that kind of quick appearance in that film of Larry Fishburne playing a character he would play later on, Bumpy Johnson, fighting his way into the the cotton club and, and and the brothers are estranged and then he he points at him when uh sam man williams played by gregory hines comes into the cotton club to watch his brother and then Lawrence fishburne stand up there after he done fought his way into what was supposed to be an all-white club where blacks were the performers only he said dance with your brother <laughs> and the two of them come together and do that famous uh scene crazy rhythm which is just oh man that's one of my favorite scenes in in film is the two of them showing their genius. Well, you know, toward the end of his life. Wait, uh, wait, wait with, a, with a nod to the Nicholas brothers. Oh, oh, absolutely. Harold and Fayard, no question. In fact, I want to say, let me see if I have it. I probably do. Uh, maybe. The New York Times did the obituaries. In fact, that was a crazy day. No, this is actually yesterday's New York Times. Uh, Imbogeni uh, Ngema. Those of you who South African probably know that name, and many people who are not South Africans should know the name. He made transition at 68. He's the brother who wrote the play that became the film Serafina. He made transition as well. There he is. And then on the same page, 99 years old, June Jackson Christmas, the psychiatrist, New York's mental uh, health chief under three mayors, made transition. She was among the first black women to graduate from Vassar in 1945. Uh, she headed the Department of Mental Health and Retardation Services under three mayors. She made transition in the Bronx uh, last Sunday at 99, 99 years old. A lot of people don't know this sister. I would look her up. She's a founder of the uh, Association of Black Psychiatrists. There she is with Mayor A. Beam there with the Afro. Very, very important sister. But in the obituary for, um, for Maurice Hines, he's talked about the fact that he missed his brother. You know, he had gotten to the age where he said, I've done everything I wanted to do. And so, you know, and, and it just makes you realize that when we lose the momentum, we lose the momentum of memory when we don't remember not only these people, but the institutions that created them. You know, next week, you know, we'll, we'll do something, maybe release it, not live, but for 201. But talk about Dr. King and, and again, how these black institutions created Martin Luther King. We'll talk more about that. But in 2020, for the with the increasing strain on these social structure arrangements in the world here in the united states federalism is under more strain uh, again today's new york times all the papers with this this colorado case 
uh, the Jack Smith case, the prosecutor case on, you know, whether or not Trump is above the law. The Supreme Court of the United States, by the time we get to this time next year, we could be living in a very different size society. And that's going to start now. It's already started, but it's going to come to a head in the next several months. By March, we could be looking at something very, very different. Uh, Trojan horse candidates coming in, in in these elections. We'll talk more about that maybe another time. But, you know, they're trying to gin up the border. We saw Mike, Mike Johnson down there. Um, but higher education is not going to be the model. I'll end with that for today. Claudine Gay, the story, we know Claudine Gay, that's tragic. And we know that, you know, what happened to her was wrong, but we cannot be distracted. It's not higher education. The jailbreak, which we talked and we talked about now for years, we've, we've, we've managed it. We're in it now. We're in the jailbreak. So it isn't that important to understand that. Um, and then finally, when we, uh, when we start on Monday, uh, Dr. Attorney Salenti, I want to end with what Dr. Du Bois says here after a, a two week pause for the season. Tomorrow, um, uh, Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, we'll be back with the Education of Black People, Di Attorney Salenti, and we'll leave with the words of Du Bois. This is the commencement speech he gave. I'm sorry, Dr. Carr, can you show us what the chapter looks like? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Got my marking in it. Here we are. Di Attorney Salenti. Uh, it's been that's, that's Latin, silent. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You're Latin. In fact, I was going to read from Du Bois, Long oh, Silence. Okay. Oh, okay. Long right. Silence. Long Silence. Because no, 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 no. That's what this is the point. You're raising the point. In fact, let me just um, on page 62 of the Education of Black People, and of course, everybody has it in Nubia. Um, he says, This is, mind you, this is the commencement speech that he gave in 1924. His 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 anniversary would have been 1923, but he decided. He said in 1923, I had been graduated for 35 years. I had not spoken that year because my daughter Yolanda was graduating the next year, and so in 1924, I came to. He spoke at his daughter's graduation, determined to do an unpleasant duty and do it thoroughly because he didn't like what was going on at Fisk. So he says this. He says, by the way, we'll talk about this Monday night too. Booker T. Washington's wife was there. And it was a whole beef. We'll talk about that, which is very interesting. He said, you who have not wholly forgotten your Latin. Let's just pause right there. In the age of AI and people trying to figure out ways to do intellectual work quickly, which is no intellectual work at all. Forget Latin. Put in meta nature. Mario is back from Senegal. We'll all be in Indianapolis next uh, weekend for Mashariki's rituals. But um the conference they had out there, and I know that a lot of people here, Deborah and Kat and all them who attended virtually the big conference on the 100th anniversary of the birth of Shake Out the Joke. Um, I mean, flat footed, brilliant presentations from around the world. These are black scholars and we got the best metanetra teacher on the planet in Nubia week after week doing that work. So take out Latin and put in metanetra. But it takes time. It takes time to study. He said those who have not wholly forgotten your Latin will remember that the two words of my subject are taken from the beginning of Cicero's oration in defense of Marcellus. Remember, Du Bois comes from a time where it wasn't unusual to learn Greek and Latin, and that as a Black student, he wouldn't have learned any of that had he not been in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where he was a decided minority, and then that he wanted to go to Harvard, which is reported in the report, uh, that Harvard made on enslavement and racism at Harvard, where they lift up Du Bois and they're very proud of that now, but they seem to forget that when he was a teenager and wanted to go to Harvard because he was in nearby Great Barrington, Massachusetts, the white town fathers were like, you can't go to Harvard. We'll send you to the best Negro school. And that's how he ended up at Fisk in the first place. Thank you, white boys, for doing that because Du Bois got down there. He said, the first thing I saw was the most beautiful creature God ever made. I saw them black women at the HBCU and said, yes, I must be a leader of the race. <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> these, these girls here remind me of my mama, <laughs> the black Burghards, his mother's people, Mary Burghardt. But at any rate, so thanks for that. Y'all been shafting black people for a long time. I have no aspiration to be at John Harvard's plantation. Best of luck to Professor Gay, but you stay there and we'll keep fighting for you there. You, we don't need you to bring that into because we got enough Negroes at HBCUs with the attitude that they, if only they could get to Harvard, we don't need to add another one. Anyway, 
Du Bois says, I recall the stilted translation thereof, which I committed to memory in my boyhood. This is the quote, his translation. He says, to make, no, to my long continued silence, the attorney Salenti, long silence, conscript fathers, which I have made use of in these days, not account on any of any fear, but partly from grief, partly from shame. This day brings an end. In other words, I am going to say something now. I haven't said anything up to now, partly from grief, partly from shame. We think, oh, our people, we're in trouble, or oh, I'm ashamed. I shouldn't have let this go on. No, 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 I'm going to break my silence today. He goes on and says, and also a beginning of my speaking according to my former custom, what I think and what I know. So he ends the quote there, and then he says, finally, I'll, I'll stop with this. We'll pick this up on Monday night. Du Bois is now saying to the graduating class and to the trustees there, including Booker T. Washington's wife, who is his classmate, who mad at him after he gives this speech. He says, to make these perhaps somewhat cryptic words more clear to you, may I say a few words concerning my connection with Fisk University. I was graduated from Fisk 36 years ago this month after three years of splendid inspiration and nearly perfect happiness under teachers whom I respected and amid surroundings that inspired me. I regarded the 10 years after my graduation from 1888 to 1898 simply as a sort of prolongation of my Fisk college days. I was at Harvard, but not of it. I was a student of Berlin, but still the son of Fisk. And I came back to Fisk to deliver the commencement address in 1898 and to make that address a welcome to my younger fellows into the high calling of those who had gone forth from this institution with fine determination and splendid inspiration. And he's gonna go on to say, now what's been going on since then? Just some BS and I'm breaking my long silence. Let's make 2024 the year that we break for some of us our long silence and continue and pour these clean glasses of water and join of those of us who bring in our bricks. So. We'll pause with that. And number oh, 200, wow. thank you, Prof. Oh, thank you. Silence is acquiescence, they say, right? Oh, Silence no question. Is acquiescence. Uh, so we have to we have to say something uh, yes. when it's wrong, which is what, uh, again, I think that was the spirit of the Cat Williams thing. You know, let a lot of people on this couch say some things that weren't, I'm going to come here, I'm going to say some things. <laughs> I'm gonna set the right. record straight. So in that spirit, uh, we're going to tell the truth. Uh, Veritas, which I think is the uh, calling card of Harvard. That's their their model, Veritas. Yeah, truth. What, what Rambai Lee would call uh, in Rurugu the rhetorical ethic. That's what y'all say, but y'all don't mean it. Right. Well, we're going we gonna to mean it. We're going to mean we it. We're going to mean it. We definitely and, mean it. In fact, in fact uh, uh, Ho Howard's motto is Veritas at Utilitas, uh, truth and service. They took Veritas from Harvard and Utilitas from the Tuskegee spirit. It was... Uh, Kelly Miller, the dean at that time, who was friends with Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, trying to squash the beef between them, the ostensible beef. We talked about that. But I wrote an article for the Howard Magazine many years ago uh, when they would let me do those kind of things, which now I don't think that would happen. But it's fine. I said, imagine the day when we take different terms. And I used my I and shim, uh, shimzes, my I meaning truth of much more than truth. And success almost in a word of being of service. And say, imagine the day we dropped the Latin. Now, of course, the Negroes don't remember, but that's fine because uh, we have somewhere else now. Jailbroken. Right. <laughs> I was going to say, Kazi. Kazi's going to be on a t shirt. Kazi is yes. the blackest of all. Yes, well, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, I just, I'm like, you're right. We're going to have a conversation after this because, yes. you know, I, you know, I learned Latin. I got really good grades. Oh, yeah. like in Latin. Never learned meta nature until I was in my 50s. How, how mm. do I not, you know, please why Healy, we know some, right? Just, we know some words because of Kwanzaa. Because of but Kwanzaa. But the original language, even before Aramaic, we should, we should know, and they should be part of our institutions. You know, yes. you know, the Sankofa, all of the Akan words, everything. So we're, part of this work is to remember, remember, you know, Latin shouldn't be <laughs> our jumping off point or the pinnacle of like, of scholarly no. work it's, no. it's not it's not so thank you for it for that and for giving us the roadmap also I, I wanted to say those of you who are not in narrative we're going to be doing fewer things uh live on youtube so we're going to be convening a narrative also uh in nubia narrative is the is the place where all of the um pieces are stored but we also have a bookshelf 
So I'm going to make sure that this this book, uh, W.B. Du Bois's book, Frederick Douglass's book, is on our bookshelf so that the, the Nubians can can have the, the text digitally if they need it. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot more uh, discussions around books live for the Nubians. So uh, stay tuned, check your notifications, turn them on so that you don't miss uh, that uh, this year we're going to be Sam Reynolds is coming in every month. We got the Mansa Musa uh, Gold coming back and we're going to be doing cybersecurity and a host of other things uh, collectively because we have to build in the communities that are already there, the groups that are already there. I just want to encourage people to step forward and bring your your bricks, your gifts, uh, because we need you. So I just want to thank absolutely. everyone who's a part of this experience. You've made Dr. Carr, you've, you've absolutely changed my life. Uh, for the better, I I, I think our, our our orbits had to touch at some point uh, yes. for us to go to yes. where we're going to go. But this is this has been incredible, yes. and I know what's coming. So uh, stay tuned. Also, there there may be a tour. You may see Dr. Carr in them streets at different places. So no question, no question. Y'all yeah. definitely stay tuned. Stay tuned. And, and like and say, don't, don't worry about it. If you, if you're not in Nubia, don't worry. It'll just be delayed. We won't be able to do that a chat like we said. <laughs> but but uh, don't worry. We don't have the metronome. We're not going. We're not. No, 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 we're not going to forsake that assembly. But I'm saying the the exchange. The live is will be. Yeah, no question. The exchange is. Yeah, we have to do that. And that's going yeah. back to what we were doing before. Like yes. we've been going. Yeah. So I mean, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, All I right, thank you. Uh, we'll we'll uh, end with this uh, again. Um, this thing that Yores did for those who didn't come in. Oh yeah, please. Yeah. To, to do it, so we'll do it. Let me see if it's here. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, let me come back to you. I love you, love, Doctor. Love you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Happy two hundred, everybody. Happy okay. Two hundred. <laughs> yeah. All right. It started with a simple question: Can I press record? Four years and now 200 episodes later, Narrative has grown into not just the largest Africana Studies classroom in the world, but also the most engaged community committed to freedom. It is Nubia. It is the bringing of the bricks. It is the clean glass of water. It is us. In Class with Car has revolutionized the way we gather to learn, to share, and to build as a community. We thank you, Dr. Carr and Professor Hunter. We love you. And to those of you who have shared your thoughts, your stories, and your wisdom, we want you to continue this incredible journey with us. We appreciate you more than words can say.